So I wanted to just offer a few more things when I listened back. I love this talk on recitals. I love talking about it. I love talking about these things. And there was a few more things I wanted to expound on. And one of them is the Alfred method. And why I like to use the Alfred method, which is the um, children's method. They, they have an adult method as well, but I'm not as familiar with that. What I'm specifically advocating for is the um, children's method. Um, there's many, many, you know, piano books that you can use for this foundation skill building that I talk about. Actually, it's more foundation. It has some skills in it, but typically my skill building is my own program. It's not coming out of these books. But when I go from the skill building to the um, portion of the lesson where we're sight reading almost every week a new piece, working through them rather quickly, and it's teaching the students the fundamentals, offering them a solid foundation in music. I have defaulted to Alfred being my favorite, and that's for two different reasons. The first is rather personal, because when I was young, my sister and I took piano lessons at the same time, and she got to use the Alfred method, and I had to use this other one that I sort of saw as like a peewee, and I just didn't like it. I thought my songs weren't as good. I thought she had all the good songs. And uh, so I would go and learn her songs on my own, um, play them on my own, which nobody really knew about. And then later when I'm teaching students, I still love those songs. There's some great songs, an Alfred method that I just love. Now, is it my emotional connection that's making me love them even more than other books? I think that's probably true because there's some decent songs. Every piano book, they have some not so fun songs and some good ones but I find the Alfred method especially when you start getting into the green level has just got some classics that I love working with students on so that's a personal reason Um, a different reason was I wanted to offer because it was an interesting experience as a music teacher Um, when I was first um, in Brooklyn it was maybe the first or second year I was there I was I don't talk about this much and I I want to talk more about my experiences because those early years of teaching for me in both Paris and New York, I tried to teach in as many different arenas as I could. Um, I was teaching like seven days a week, all these different um, cultural backgrounds, um, all these different schools, um, after school programs, group programs, all kinds of ages. And I really, it was a concerted effort to gain experience. Like before I started to really specialize in just doing piano and voice and private lessons and for certain ages more than others, before I got to that place, I wanted to teach as many students and with as many backgrounds, as many ages as I could and just get as you know, as much experience in a short amount of time as I could. And it was also about paying the bills. So I had gotten, this was just part of many jobs I had. I probably had like seven different teaching jobs. I would, you know, put them all together to make a living because as an after-school teacher, it wasn't like I would just, I was, I've never been hired just by a school to be their music teacher, right? I've always been involved at the after-school programs or the conservatories or the music schools, or in some cases coming in and being contract work to teach music. Um, So I'm always putting together a lot of different um, employers. And this was, I believe it was, I know it was Friday night. And that might have only been one night a week. Um, But it was Friday nights I would go to this music school out in Queens in a pretty rough area. And my job was to only teach the first lesson because the first lesson was free. So um, by teaching, I was supposed to, you know, the the way they pulled students in was to say that the first lesson was free. I was supposed to teach this one, this 30-minute lesson in this room with a window where the parents could watch us. And um, and that's what I would do. And it was, I actually, there were some cool things about the job because, you know, it was a lot of times people coming in off the streets for this. Sometimes they were scheduled, sometimes they're off the street. Some Fridays I had a lot. Many Fridays I didn't have many, so when I they weren't when I didn't have a student to teach, I was supposed to be working on arrangements for um, different things, you know, for the students to work on. So that was fun because I got um, paid to sit there and work through different arrangements and get better at doing that and doing it at different levels for the students. It was really fun. 
I enjoyed that part of the of it very much. And then turns out I enjoyed teaching this first lesson because I got really good at teaching a first lesson. Um, all different ages again, all different backgrounds. Although many of the students that came in there were they to me it did seem like a more of a lower socioeconomic situation. Um, So that might have been a little bit more similar in those students, but they wanted me to use the Alfred method, which I was fine doing. And it's one of the reasons why I got very, very good with that book. And I liked the way they did it. You know, I started to really prefer the way they did it um, because some of the other methods um, that are the most popular, like Piano Adventures is the Fabers, are probably more popular than Alfred at this point, if I had to guess. Many, many music schools seem to default to those. Um, one of the things that they don't want in those books is they, they want to teach right from the beginning that you know you can put your hand position in a lot of different places on the piano and not stay sort of stuck in one place. And I can recognize that that is you know, a a good thing to do. Like right from the start when students are young, just getting them used to things is a good idea because they don't know to think that it's hard, right? So, but it can, for some students, destabilize it. It can, for some students, make it a bit confusing. And um, because they're, they're moving hand position a lot, Whereas in the Alpha method, there's a bit more of what's called anchoring, what I like, which is where you're teaching the student to keep your hand position, you know, kind of locked in in one spot. In particular, I do my own. It corresponds a little better with the skill building I do, which is a lot of C um, uh, five finger exercises finger exercises in the key of C. So it works a little bit better because they'll sort of sit in that C position and kind of right at the right time. So I can, it's always nice when you can sort of be having themes through the skill building, through the lesson book in those early stages because students can get overwhelmed very, very quickly in the beginning, no matter what their age is, right? And so um, that job really afforded me getting very good at that first lesson. And to this day, it serves me. It really does serve me well to be very clear about, you know, give me a lot of time. I think I was at that job for maybe a year. Give me a lot of time to really think if you're, if this student is fresh and they know nothing, how do you approach it? Or how do you actually find out what a student knows and then build on that, right? From any level, because some students come in and know absolutely nothing about music. Um, more and more so these days since their, their schools aren't teaching them much. Um, but other students, most of them have some level. And so how do you integrate that? How do you work with that? How do you, you know, it's, it's always the trick in lessons to make sure you're not boring the child and going over things that they already know or talking down to them. Nobody likes that, right? So, um, that's, my reason for doing the Alfred method, and I just wanted to mention that's part of the reason why um, maybe even sometime here, um, just doing a first lesson, that would actually be a really fun YouTube video, just what I like to do in the first lesson of piano, like how to get them going, right? Um, And then then I could actually map out the first four and do a little program like that. So um, now I didn't stay at that school because... One of the things that I found, and I'm certainly not going to say the name of the school, but this is another caution for parents. Um, What I found with that school in particular is that they were locking them into buying very expensive digital pianos um, and, and having to lock into these contracts right then and there. Right after my lesson that I would teach them, which I was getting pretty darn good at doing, then they would be pulled in and sold this contract. Now I understand from a certain standpoint, like committing the student is a good idea, but from another standpoint, I don't recommend this. I mean, I think that sometimes when you put too much on the head of a student and those lessons, like, oh, I paid for this piano and oh, I paid for those lessons and you better appreciate this, that never, ever, ever works. Okay. It's much better to baby step in and say, you know, there has to be some commitment level. Like let's say, ideally, okay, we're going to sign up for this semester. And for this semester, you're going to need to show up for these lessons. And we're going to see now if you do well with them, we 
we'll be able to upgrade you to possibly a better piano. But for the six months, we're going to start you at this very cheap baby piano and let's see how you do. And many students like the challenge of that. Many students like, you know, to work towards a better keyboard. Um, and it actually works better for both adults and um, young students to not put that level of pressure of like all this commitment level, like you're, you've got to commit to two years up front because it's going to be up and down. There's going to be times when they like it and there's going to be times they don't like it. And so you're, you know, for me, the baby steps is better because there's a lot of self-sabotage. There's a lot of putting too much pressure or putting too many expectations, especially from the adults that can really sabotage your lessons. Reasonable expectations, building on what you are accomplishing. These are important aspects for both children and um, adults when approaching music. So putting too much pressure on yourself or your student by saying, oh, I'm going to commit you to this, this, and this, and you better live up to it, and then guilting them when it's like, oh, I bought you this expensive piano and you're not playing it. I have found that over and over again that leads to this sort of shame, and, and it's there's nothing worse than when your shame and your unworthiness gets tied to music <laughs> because music is such a comfort and such a joy. And when it gets tied in with your own sense of unworthiness and shame, which can so easily happen and did happen with many old school methods, um, then you lose out on that, right? Instead, your association with music is not what it could be if it was free from that. So keep that in mind. Um, that was just one of the many, when you're in the trenches like I was for many years teaching music lessons, you just figure out a lot of things about what works and what doesn't work. And always for me, the idea for, um, the idea behind it was to instill a long, lifelong relationship with music so that it can be a source of comfort. And that was the thing I said at this recital. And I'll kind of close out with this. Um, at this recital, I actually heard a, a, a teacher who's been in, you know, is an actual music teacher in an elementary school, has been for many, many years. I think she was just recently switching schools. So she's been at different places, but always this role of a music teacher. Then on top of that, she's teaching music lessons outside of school, which many, many music teachers are doing, um, bless their hearts. And she just I've got tears when I heard her speak at her lesson about, you know, the importance of music for these children. And I wished I had recorded it because I would have shared it. I mean, it was absolutely encapsulating the reason why it's such a good idea for these students to learn music and that you're, you know, the, the school system itself is only going to be able to do so much at this point. They're just not focused there. So having these supplemental lessons outside is really important. But beyond that, when, I, when it was my recital and it was my turn to sort of say something about, um, you know, why music, the, the thing that came to me was the idea of like, my decision to learn music is one of those decisions that not only do I not regret, um, because backing up really quickly, I quit music, you know, when I was young, I, I was given music lessons. I, it was a classical teacher. I never got to improvise. I will tell that story. I have told that story and I will tell it again. Um, but as an adult, I came back to music on my own. And when I did that decision to do that, I have never regretted. And I've made a lot of bad decisions, trust me, uh, since that time, you know, and still make some bad decisions. Um, but that one is one that I tell people you will never, ever regret. And not only that, what I said at this recital is it's the gift that keeps on giving, because no matter what I go through in life, I do have music as a comfort, not only listening to it, but playing it, creating it, um, joining with others um, and playing it. It's just been a gift that, that continues to grow exponentially. And that's precisely what I'd like to do for my students in whatever way that connection can be formed for them. 
So it's absolutely imperative that more important than how much they're progressing and how good they're getting is that we're going at the right pace to instill that type of love of music so that it will be a gift for them for their whole life. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and close out today um, and go ahead and play the fully produced version of How Can I Keep From Singing. I also put this up on my Friday night video last week. It was actually a live performance from in the middle of me, you know, working on this production. I was out playing it live and so I, I posted a live performance of it as solo because it was just a song that I was playing all the time. And what I'll talk about a little bit more next week is how that continues to be such an important song to me right now and such an important part of the message that I'm trying to convey with music as a metaphor. So we'll talk more about that next week. But in the meantime, I, uh, I hope that you feel the same way and you just keep on singing.
can I keep?